Hello everyone and welcome to another Wood Electronic ISOs webinar. My name is Silas Zorn and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is Transformer Design for EMC. Our speaker today is Christoph Berner, who is working as a design engineer at Wood Electronic ISOs. He will hold the webinar and answer it then your questions. Before we start with the webinar, I would, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar today. This means then you can, that you cannot ask us questions via your microphone. But you have the chance to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find us in the right side on the uh, question mark button. Yeah, the, today's webinar would be about 30 minutes long. And after that, we will start with a short Q&A session. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, Christopher will answer it, them via email in the next days. So after the webinar in the next days. Um, last information for you, you will all receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording. Uh, of the webinar in the next days. So I give over to you, Christoph, and I wish you an exciting webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Silas. A warm welcome also from my side. I will now start to share my presentation so everyone can see it. Okay, Silas, can, can everyone see the yes. presentation? Yes, perfect. Then we are good to start. Uh, thanks everyone for, for joining me today for this webinar. I will talk about transformer design for EMC. I am a design engineer for power transformers and custom magnetics here at Wolf Electronics Midcom. Uh, so it is really our daily business to develop new product, new power transformers. And of course, when we develop a new product, we try to implement all these nice features that make it a good transformer. So I will talk today about parasitic properties of transformers and the transformer impact on EMC, electromagnetic compatibility. This is a particularly interesting topic because a transformer is a passive component. So at the first glance, you would say, well, how can it impact the EMI? It, it's passive. It will only uh, transmit or radiate whatever is whatever we put into the transformer with our power supply, right? Uh, but if we take a closer look, we will see that the internal construction of the transformer can can influence the EMI behavior. So uh, at the beginning, I will give a very quick theoretic introduction about conducted and radiated emissions, but I will keep it short because the main purpose of this webinar is to show you what we, Worth Electronics, uh, can do as a manufacturer to make the transformer as good as possible. So I will really focus on the internal construction, how the, how the windings are positioned inside the winding window uh, and so on. So I will show a few good EMC design practices that we always try to follow. In the end, I will also show uh, the influence of shield bindings uh, on the EMI behavior and additional measures what we can do. So to get started, uh, here's a schematic of a transformer. In the center of the schematic, you see the ideal transformer with just a primary inductance, a secondary inductance uh, coupled with a magnetic core. But of course, in reality, uh, such a transformer has also many parasitics. So we have, of course, a resistance on the primary and on the secondary winding. We have a leakage inductance, which is a measure for the amount of magnetic coupling between the windings. Then we have a intra-winding capacitance. This is this capacitance exists on both sides, on the primary and on the secondary. 
and it is really it, it defines how strongly the individual turns inside one winding couple to each other. So depending on how, how, how it is wound in one layer or in two layers, or maybe in even more layers, the capacitance of each winding can change dramatically. And then we have the interwinding capacitance, which is here shown as the capacitance between primary and secondary. And to get this webinar started correctly and no one falls asleep, I would like to ask you a question before we get into it. So just imagine a case where you have a conducted noise, a conducted emission in your power supply and you want to get rid of it. And you think that maybe it might be the, tr the transformer who causes the problem. So here comes the question. Which parasitics do you think we should optimize uh, to get rid of this conducted emission? And I will give you now about 20 seconds to think about it. Uh, if you want, you can also write your answer in the chat. Uh, and on the next slide, I will, I will present the solution. Okay, here we go. So we distinguish between conducted emission and radiated emission. Uh, a conducted emission is always transmitted by the, by the electric path. So we talk here about an isolated transformer where primary and secondary are electrically not connected. They are only connected by the magnetic core. And as you see here also, by the interwinding capacitance. So if we apply a higher frequency signal, of course, the impedance of the capacitor goes down and it becomes conducting. So the noise that we inject into the transformer can pass through the interwinding capacitance. It is therefore a main target to reduce the interwinding capacitance if we want to improve the EMI behavior of the transformer. On the right hand, you see the radiated emissions. This is, this is the high frequency regime in the, let's say, more than 10 or 30 megahertz. In this regime, the, the source of the noise is, is really radiated into the air. So we consider the, the transformer in this case like an antenna. Uh, whatever signal we put into the transformer it will be emitted as radiation. And now if you think about the wire that is inside the transformer, a very typical length of wire can be in the range between 50 centimeter and maybe two meter. And anyone who has a radio station at home to, to receive radio signals, to listen to music, you know that uh, maybe a 70 centimeter antenna is is perfect to receive such signals. So we are here really in a range of wire length that can work as an antenna. Uh, and this radiated emission, it can couple into everything, into PCB traces, into other components, into cables, even into external circuits surrounding maybe your power supply. So in order to keep the radiated emission low, we want to improve the behavior of the transformer. Now we go a little bit into theory. Uh, we look at the switching profile of a flyback transformer. And on the right hand side, we see the resulting noise spectrum of this transformer. And we see very clearly that a conducted noise, a conducted emission shows up in this spectrum at higher harmonics of the switching frequency. So in this case, the switching frequency is around 115 kilohertz. And here we see a very, very big peak at 230 kilohertz. So we know the source of the noise is the switch. Uh, the, when the switch opens and closes, we see uh, very steep slopes in the voltage. 
diagram in a voltage path. And therefore, it creates EMI issues at those higher harmonics. So we see another peak at three times the switching frequency, and it goes on into a very high frequency regime. Then here beyond 10 megahertz, we see another peak, a very big one. This is what we consider already as radi radiated emission. We see it here on the next slide. Now this is a close up into the high frequency regime. Um, this is what we call a, a, a resonance phenomena. So parasitic properties on your power supply uh, can form LC resonators. And whenever the switch turns on or off, we have a steep slope, uh, a fast change of, of voltage. And this, this change of voltage can excite an oscillator. So those, those unwanted LC resonators on your circuit, on your PCB, they start to ring. And with this ringing, uh, we have very high frequency signals in the circuit. And again, the transformer will just be the antenna who emits the signal. So most of the time when your power supply fails the EMI test, the transformer is not really the root cause. It is just the result, the medium, which transmits the noise to the surrounding. With this, we go into practical approaches how to improve the transformer. And the very first thing, and probably the most important thing I want to show you here, is how to connect a transformer on the power supply. It is very, very important to connect the start of the winding to the switch. So you see here in this diagram, the transformer is shown as L1 and L2. This is primary and secondary winding. And the start of the winding is here indicated with a black dot. And if we now look into the construction, this is a cross section of the transformer. Uh, you see here also the start of the winding indicated as a black dot. And as you can see, the, the start of the winding is, of course, buried very deep inside the transformer. So the, the, the remaining turns, the, the remaining winding, is wound over the start, it buries the start below. Then we have here an interface to the secondary and on top the secondary winding. So if we now connect the switch to the start of the winding, we have the, the source of the EMI, the, 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 the steep slopes and the voltage. We have this buried very deep inside the transform. And if we look at the equation, we see the, the common mode current is proportional to the capacitance and to the change of voltage, du by dt. So what we have connected here to the switch, we call this the switching node or the high du by dt. And the end of the primary winding is called the quiet node or the low du by dt. So we really see as we go along the winding, the voltage increases if we come from the end or decreases if we, if we look from the start. And not only the voltage decreases, but also the change of voltage. So the du by dt decreases as we go along the winding. And you can see here very clearly uh, the the interface between primary and secondary is here, those yellow lines. This is where the insulation tape is. So looking at the interface, it seems like here is now already a low du by dt, which will result in a low common mode loss. Then if we have connected the transformer correctly to the, to the switch in the correct orientation, and we still have a problem with EMI, then what else can we do? Uh, there's a very clear guideline from our side that smaller transformer can help to reduce EMI noise. 
Uh, why is this? It is a, it's, it's a very simple answer. Um, a smaller transformer will have less capacitance because just the size is smaller, right? The interface between the windings is smaller. It will have smaller lead wires and even a smaller length of total wire inside the transformer. So we just have a, sm a smaller antenna. It has also a smaller gap in the ferrite if we talk about a flyback transformer with, with, a, with a gapped core. And in the end, this will also result in a lower leakage inductance. So overall, we expect less conducted and less radiated noise in a smaller transformer. There is one challenge though. Uh, if we make the transformer smaller, what happens? And of course, it, it can handle less power. So what do we need to do to get the same amount of power with a smaller transformer? We need to increase the switching frequency. And if we do so, we probably end up with another problem just somewhere else on the PCB. Maybe, maybe now we fail the EMI test at a different frequency, at a different position. We don't know. Anything can happen. But from a transformer point of view, a smaller transformer is better. Now we can look into the internal construction of the transformer. And I mentioned in the very beginning that the interwinding capacitance is the most important property which we want to optimize. Um, looking at the cross section, this transformer looks very much like a plate capacitor. So the primary and the secondary form solid metal plates, which are coupled. And from our days at school, we maybe still know the equation to calculate the capacitance of such a plate capacitor. It depends on the surface A and the distance D. So basically all we can do is either uh, reduce the surface A or we increase the distance D. Uh, and here's how we do it. We can uh, either uh, use a margin tape on both sides. So you see here in, in this in this picture, the, the primary winding uses the complete space available in the bobbin. Now, if we if we insert here a spacer on the side, uh, we would effectively reduce the width of the winding. And with this, we would also reduce the, the surface area A that they overlap to the secondary. The other thing we can do is to use a special bobbin with two winding windows. You see this here in this small picture. Here, the primary and the secondary, they are not wound on top of each other, but they are wound next to each other. And in the middle, there's a solid plastic spacer, which keeps them apart. We can, we can define the thickness, maybe one millimeter, maybe half a millimeter. And this is very effective because now we have reduce the surface area basically to zero, right? They are not wound on top of each other. They have only looking at the thickness of the winding. This is maybe less than one millimeter. So they only are side by side with a very small overlap. Uh, the other thing we can do is increase the distance. So you see here the, the interface between the primary and the secondary is defined by this, by these two yellow lines of tape. Now, if we put four, four layers of tape instead of two, obviously we have doubled the distance between the windings. There is one problem. Um, both of these measures, or both of these changes will directly affect the leakage inductance. Uh, if you think about it, it is very clear, both the capacitance and the leakage inductance, they are they define how well primary and secondary couple to each other. So for the leakage inductance, we try to achieve good coupling. We try to get these, these windings as close to each other as possible. Sometimes we would even wind them together at the same time in a bifilar winding step to, to have the best overlap possible. But then for the capacitance, we want them as far apart as possible. 
you have to get low coupling. So it's always a trade-off. We, we need to find what the power supply really needs. In most cases, the leakage inductance wins. So we have to optimize the leakage inductance to make the transformer work in the application. Because otherwise, if the leakage inductance is too big, you will just need a huge snubber circuit, or um, you will you will put a lot of of energy into your switch. It it might break the switch. Uh, but then we might end up with a big capacitance. So it, it's a trade-off, a, a case by case scenario. Uh, that's one of the main reasons why we offer custom magnetics because every power supply is different, and we always need to optimize it for the application. And we have one little choker, which is the dielectric constant down here, the epsilon zero and epsilon r. Uh, the, the dielectric constant will not affect the leakage inductance. It's not a magnetic property, it's just a dielectric property. So the, the material between primary and secondary has a certain dielectric. Uh, if we reduce it, we can also reduce the capacitance without affecting the leakage inductance. Um, so we, we can use varnishes or potting compounds with low dielectric properties, uh, or probably sometimes it's best to use nothing at all because air is already pretty good, right? It has a dielectric constant of one. Okay, then in, in the next step, if the EMI, EMI behavior of the transformer is still not good enough and we we need to further improve it, we can try to insert a shield winding. Uh, here on this slide, we talk about a internal shielding, which means the shield winding is positioned between the primary and the secondary. Um, in this case, it is a copper foil. You see in these pictures how it is manufactured. Uh, first, uh, first the operator would solder a lead wire to one end of the foil, so we can later connect th the start of the foil to to a stable potential, for example, to ground. Um, then the, the the foil is wrapped into insulation tape. And then it is inserted into the transformer. I think everyone knows why we need insulation tape on the copper foil. Uh, the foil is inside the winding window. So if the start and the finish of the, of the foil would touch each other, this shield winding would form one turn inside the transformer. And the turn is shorted to itself. So if, if we would do this, we could only measure leakage inductance then on the primary side, and all the magnetizing inductance would be gone because it just induces circulating currents inside the shield. So we must be very careful not to short the shield winding to itself. Uh, here on the right hand side, you see a, a test uh, which we did. Um, it's a 20 watt flyback transformer in a switch mode power supply. Uh, we tested it two times uh, with and without shield. And you see very clearly how strongly the noise is reduced with the shield winding. Then if the, if the copper foil is a little bit too expensive for the application, just if, if the transformer is very much cost driven, and you want uh, a cheap solution, then we can also offer a wire wound shielding. It is physically the same. Uh, we still put a shield winding between the primary and the secondary. The shield winding is not allowed to short to itself. But this time we wind the shield with wire instead of foil. So here shown in the, in the schematic, you see a primary on the bottom, then one layer of shield winding, and then a secondary on top. And we have two ways of manufacturing it. Here, this one, we, we start the shield winding on a regular pin of the transformer. 
then we wind it with our automatic machine. And then we cut the wire tail and we can bury the wire tail between two layers of tape inside the winding window. This is basically the, this gives the best performance for a wire wound shield. Uh, but it is still a manual process because a person has to take this wire tail and put it in the correct position and fix it with tape. Uh, the much more elegant version if we have two open pins on the transformer. So two pins that are not in use, which we can, can now use for the shield winding. We can start the shield winding on one pin, wind the shield, and then terminate the finish just on another pin, one that is not used. Uh, it is then important for the customer to connect only one side of the shield winding to, to the stable potential. Uh, and maybe we can cut the other pin away so it, it doesn't disturb. And the benefit of this one, of this method is it is fully automatable. So we can just put the transformer on our automatic machines. We can program everything and it will automatically put the shield binding in place. So now you might ask me, well, if it's so easy and we can do it automatically, why do we not put it on every transformer? Uh, the answer is simple. Even though it can be done automatically, the shield will still occupy space inside the winding window. So here in the schematic, we exaggerated it a little bit, but you see here the shield takes about one third of the available winding space. So of course, everyone tries to optimize his power supply for the best efficiency and every every point of percentage uh, counts. So definitely we want to use all the available winding space for the actual winding that carries the current, right? The primary and the secondary. So if not absolutely needed, we would try to skip the shield winding and we only put it if the customer really requires it. Maybe the customer has, has seen EMI issues already. And uh, of course, if we know it's needed, then we can put it. Uh, in a case where the transformer is completely full and we are not able to put the internal shield winding, as I just showed, then we have also the chance to put an external shielding around the transformer. This is what you call a flux band. Uh, it can be it can be added after the transformers have been built already. So it is completely external. We don't need to open the transformer. Um, the, the, the physical principle is different. While the, the internal shield winding really uh, fights against the root cause. So it it removes the noise between primary and secondary before before it couples. So it basically redirects the noise to to the stable potential. Here this flux band, uh, it only it only removes radiated noise. So it 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 can hardly fight against conducted emission because it is around the transformer, right? It will only it can only shield what comes out of the transformer as a radiation. Uh, it is expensive to add these, this shield winding because it is a manual process. Uh, in contrast to the internal shield winding, now on the external, we can connect start and finish of the foil together. So this one is allowed to short to itself. We usually even add a little uh, spot of solder to, to guarantee a good connection. Here's a little trick that we that we tried in the past. Instead of wrapping the whole transformer into a flux band, we can also just put a little sticker of a copper foil onto the side of the core. Uh, the benefit is, of course, it is less less labor, so it's it's much quicker just to put the sticker. Um, we can still solder a lead wire to the foil, uh, so we can can connect 
the foil and the complete core to ground, to the system ground. Um, and because the, the core is conductive, a ferrite material, it doesn't conduct very well, but it is a conductive material. And the complete core is grounded anyways, even if we only connect one little spot to the ground potential. And uh, it, it showed pretty good results. So we have some active parts that use this method. An even better solution would be to use an external cap for shielding. So here you see, for example, an EFD20 uh, transformer. It is 20 millimeter wide. The EFD shape means that it is very flat. Uh, and on this package, we have by default a metal cap on top. Uh, the main reason is not for EMI purpose. The main reason is uh, to get a flat surface for the pick and place machine. Because you can see here in this picture, the, the top surface of the transformer is not very even and it's not flat. So it would be difficult to, to pick and place this, this component with an automatic machine. But nevertheless, the metal cap has exactly the same effect as a copper foil. It will shield all radiated noise coming out of the transformer. And it, this, this uh, cap is highly available. We put it basically on every transformer of this package size. So uh, there is no lead time issues or whatever. It gets even better if the, if the cap has an additional pin to connect into the PCB. So here on this example, here you can see it clearly from the metal cap, there's a little pin, and then you can, can really connect the, the core and the metal cap to your ground potential. The most elegant way without any effort is to use our EP package. Uh, this transformer has a completely closed ferrite core. We have it in different sizes, ranging from EP5 to EP13. I think we even have an EP15. Uh, it, it doesn't add any cost because ferrite is cheap, uh, and we, we have this in big quantities. Uh, it shows excellent EMI performance uh, due to the fact that the core is closed already. Very little radiation can come out of the transformer. And with this, I would like to come to a few topics and things which we try to avoid in a good transformer design. And one of them is definitely flying leads. Sometimes it is needed to have flying leads. Uh, in most cases, this is due to the isolation requirements. For example, if someone needs a reinforced insulation for a pretty high working voltage, uh, it can happen that we need to meet 10 or maybe even 20 millimeter of creepage distance between primary and secondary. And in such a case, we would use a triple insulated wire on the secondary side, and we would just extend the wire outside of the transformer, as you can see it here. So the, the, the wire exits the transformer, and as long as the insulation is not damaged anywhere, we can meet easily 20 millimeter of creepage. So the purpose is to, to move the, the point where it's terminated away from the transformer. The problem with this approach is flying leads make great antennas. These, these flying leads, they run very often parallel to PCB traces. So they, they, couple, they couple strongly into your PCB. So from our side, there's only one thing to say, please try to avoid it. It is also not very good for manufacturability and even worse for the end customer for uh, assembly. So if you have flying leads, every transformer must be assembled manually because basically no machine can insert these flying leads into the PCB and solder them automatically. Another thing that we try to avoid is the, the EI core style where one half of the core looks like an E and the other half looks like an I. 
Uh, this was very common for 50 hertz power transformers in the past. And people, u people used uh, tape to create a uniform gap on all the core legs. So we, we had three unshielded gaps. And those gaps on the outside, they of course radiate a lot of, a lot of emission into the air surrounding the transformer. It is much better to use the modern approach with, with a regular power ferroid, where only the center leg is gapped. So in this case, we have no gaps on the outside. So that basically there's nothing to shield because no radiation comes out here. And a little bit of bigger gap in the center leg, but this gap is covered by the winding on the left and on the right. So the, the radiation that comes out of, this, of the center gap, it, it will be dissipated at least partially inside the winding. Of course, this will affect a little bit the efficiency. Uh, the effect is called fringing. So the magnetic field that comes out of the center gap uh, will cause AC loss in the winding itself. But any loss you have, you can be sure that at least it will not show up in your EMI spectrum. And with this, I would like to end my presentation today. I thank you again very much for joining me. And I am now open for questions. Yeah, thank you, Christoph, for the interesting presentation. Now we will come to your questions. And I will see we have many questions in the chat. So I would think we can directly start with the first question. So first question, how should I connect a shield winding on the PCB? Okay, yes. Uh, in order to have an effective shield winding, it is very important to connect it to a stable potential. It does not necessarily need to be the ground potential. It can also be a high voltage potential. It, it's only important it is a quiet, a stable potential without any, any change of voltage, no du by dt. Okay, thank you. So next question. I have a power supply that failed the EMC test. What can I do? Okay, yeah, yeah. this is a, a common question. We have heard this before already sometimes. Um, I, I try to explain it as good as I can. Um, if the transformer is completed already, if you have stock of the transformer available and you need to make it past the EMC test, then the only option you have is either a shielding cap that can be placed on top or maybe a flux band that can be wrapped around the transformer to shield the radiated emission. If, if the source of the noise is conducted emission, then we probably need a redesign with an internal shield winding. Thank you. So next question. Is the coupling from the transformator a near or a fair field coupling? My exper experiential shows that the trafos does not radiate it in far field only as a source for near field new field, new field, so sorry, coupling into larger cables which act as a tenor. Okay, thank you for this question. Um, I would need to think a bit about it, but my first answer would be, well, any radiation that is emitted will, if you are far enough, 
on the transformer and you look from far away, it will end up as far field radiation, right? It, it, it doesn't stop at a point uh, from, if you want to model it with equations of with physics, uh, I think if you are close to the transformer, you need to use the near field approximation. If you are far away, you should use the far field approximation. If the if the magnitude is strong in the far field, I don't know, probably no, because right the, the power level of the emission is small. And if you if you are one meter away, it radiates already onto a circle, like onto a uh, onto a circle with, with, a, with a radius of one meter. So the ratio per per area goes down extremely fast. Um, but in the near field, obviously the PCB traces and other cables are extremely close to the transformer. So I think you are right when you say that the near field is dominating the behavior. Okay, thank you for the answer. So we come to the next question. With, uh, with each of techniques, your maniation very helpful. Can you describe if it address CM or DM more than the other? Yes, most of most of the techniques I showed with internal shield windings are mostly for common mode noise. So anything that is transmitted through the transformer. I am not too sure if it also has an effect on differential mode. I would like to review this uh, after the webinar and give you an answer by email if that's okay. Okay, perfect. So, I would say last question for today. What are your thoughts on the pitch cap between primary or secondary benefits or risks? So I think you talk about a, a Y cap. I think that's how it's called in literature. Uh, it, it definitely is useful to reduce the EMI. Uh, very often the, the limitation for using a Y cap is the isolation requirements, right? Uh, if you implement the Y cap between primary and secondary, it has a breakdown voltage of, I don't know, maybe 4,000 volts. But if your transformer has an isolation of six or maybe even eight kilovolts, then you would have created a weak spot just by placing the capacitor. So th this makes it sometimes a little bit unpractical. Thank you. Okay. I would say one last question. Um, is the flux band or internal wire shield reducing the creepage distance in a significant way at standard bul bulbins? So, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, I think I mentioned it with the with the metal caps. Oh no, I didn't mention it. Maybe I wanted to mention it. So if you place the metal cap on top of the transformer, I showed it for the EFD20 package. Uh, the, the, the metal is very close to the primary and to the secondary side. So obviously you have created a shortcut from primary to secondary and your creepage distance goes down to maybe one or two millimeters only. And the same if we use a flux band, the width of the flux band can be very wide. Um, so we always need to consider the shortest path from primary to secondary. And uh, the flux band is considered as dead metal. So we have to, to remove the width of the flux band from the total creepage distance. And it, it gets even worse because some safety standards like the 61558, which is very common, um, under some circumstances, it does not allow to split the creepage distance. So it explicitly says, no dead metal is allowed in the creepage path. In this case, we would we would probably need a different solution, or we would need to cover the flux band completely into tape, 
maybe even three layers of tape to to guarantee reinforced insulation to the to the metal. Okay, thank you for the last answer. So, yeah, we are finished uh, today uh, with the webinar today. So, if there are any questions left, we will answer it then via email in the next days. So, yeah, thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoyed it our webinar. Also, many thanks to you, Christoph, and yeah, I hope we will hear us at our next webinar and. I wish you I wish you a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.